All right, thank you. Um, I gonna, I guess I'll start by um, saying that you know a lot of this work I did with with Reza. So um, the good parts of this talk are give credit to Reza, and if I mess something up, it is is entirely my fault. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's start. Um, I'm gonna start actually like at the beginning, and, and I think this is helpful for me at least. Um, I, I start by, t I'm gonna talk about things you already know about Beam in order so you understand how I'm thinking about state and timers and how I, it fits in with the other things. Um, so I'll go quickly through that. So I guess the beginning is you have your graph, right? This is you probably, many people have been talking about and showing graphs. It's anything, you have these boxes that are doing computation and arrows between them. And some of the boxes are, um, subgraphs, right? They um, may contain a number of other transformations. And that's the basic idea of Beam. Um, and there's basically two fundamental operations that I first want to describe and illustrate in sort of my way of thinking about them. Um, you've already heard about them and used them and seen them used in practice. But pardo, parallel do, it's a uh, the way that that fits in with state and timers is that you first understand that this is doing the same thing to every element, right? This is embarrassingly parallel. It's pretty obvious how you can distribute this across an unlimited number of machines. Um, you know, it's not always map, sometimes it's filter or sometimes it's flat map, it outputs like more than one element for input, but it's not, you know, there's no mystery how to implement this and you don't have to store any state. So that's the one fundamental programming paradigm Right. And the, the second one um, that I'll highlight here is, is just combining, right? Getting all of the elements of some type into the same place so that you can combine them, right? It could be group by key, could be called reduce and map reduce, could be combined per key. A global combine is the same thing. It just needs to, you know, have one key for everything getting grouped together. Um, and you usually implement this with an associative and commutative operation. And that gives like an execution engine a bunch of options for how it can actually do the computation. It can do two layers of reduction uh, so that you don't have to actually read a huge amount of data on one machine. Um, the, the key here, uh, so I've, I should have explained, but you know, squares are inputs, triangles are outputs here, right? And the, the color here I'm using to indicate the key that you're grouping by. So all the yellow squares, that's uh, those are like one key. So you get those all into one machine, you combine them into a yellow triangle. Um, so et cetera for green squares and red squares. Uh, and an important part of this when you're doing extreme processing is that the, the, the it's sort of implicitly stateful. You, you're using state under the hood. You do not think about state, you write an associative commutative operation and then um, the runner or your uh, data processing engine is able to parallelize it and checkpoint the state, but there is some state involved um, because you have to wait for all of the elements for a particular uh, key to arrive so that you can know that you have all the data. Um, so this sometimes this is called stateful processing. Um, I would call this stateful implementation. Um, and I think it's sort of it's more helpful to think about since you're not co coding anything having to do with state. Um, that's not what I call stateful processing, at least for this talk. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. Those are the two, those are sort of the two fundamental primitives. There's other stuff you can do with Beam, but these are the, uh, you know, the two core things, right? It's map and reduce. There's no magic there. Um, and in Beam, we also have windowing. So when you do an aggregation and you're gathering up all the elements for one key for an aggregation, you're also gathering by um, some event time window. And that makes it sort of automatically work with, you can have huge streams and it can be out of order. Um, and these two primitives still work just fine. So all these quotes are just use cases that sort of work in Beam without you having to do very much, right? Parsing the incoming events and filtering out bad data, super easy. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read them all, but grouping elements into sessions involves like some more advanced windowing in Beam. But the basic idea of saying we've got elements that come in, I choose how I'm gonna group them, I group them, uh, and then I emit some output and I do some aggregation like that. That works really well uh, with Beam's um, 
sort of P collection, a windowed P collection model. Um, and I'm emphasizing that because that's going to be important. Um, so this talk is about when those aren't good enough, of course. Um, we have windows and triggers, and there's been some, some talks about advanced windowing use cases and how to how to work with this and think about windowing. And sometimes you're you're trying to use Beam's windows and triggers and you're just getting like it's just not working, right? You're, it doesn't address what you actually need, or it's it's either too generic, like here's you don't actually know, um, like the triggers are very generic. They don't know anything about your data, right? Triggers aren't specific enough for your use case, um, or some some aggregations are not really an associative community of operator, um, and so those don't fit into this model, um, and. The very last quote here, by the way, I, these are all quotes from me making up what I think your use case could be, right? I've, I've seen a bunch of user um, cases, and these are just quick summaries of like four big categories. Um, but the big one, wanting to output when no data is coming in, right? When you're doing these aggregations, these are just functions over the data. But a lot of streaming use cases actually involve reacting to the fact that a user hasn't actually done anything in a while, or to the fact that your pipeline's been running for a long time. So. Um, these are sort of other use cases where the MapReduce, this, this DAG of MapReduce style operations is not going to apply automatically. So that's state and timers is sort of a hybrid. It's a new primitive operation, right? It's, it's a, a third fundamental operation for uh, processing data. Um, and I think I should I should shout out I think there there was another talk on splittable do fund which is also a, a new fundamental pattern which I just don't have here because you don't need to know about it in this context. But yeah, so let's I don't want to I don't want to pretend these are the only patterns. But state and timers is a third pattern, and it's sort of a hybrid of combine or reduce, right? Because what it does, like in Beam, and this is a, some decision that we made as to how this parallel pattern could work, is for a key and window, you group together all the elements. Like here we have the yellow squares and we're uh, grouping them all together. And then we feed them to a processor one by one in sort of a single threaded manner. Because part of Beam, um, which I, I know was mentioned earlier, is uh, resist the temptation to do fancy things in your own code or parallelize your own code. Um, we have patterns where you write more or less very simple code. Um, and because you're programming in this pattern, it's going to have some parallelism built in and some scalability built in. So here, all of the elements for a particular key and window, they're all gathered together and they're fed one by one to, to your processor. And it is able to you know, do whatever processing it wants on the element, but it can also save some state, which it can access on the next element. Uh, and it can set timers, which could cause it to be invoked, cause you to have some callback so you can do some processing when there's no elements uh, showing up. So this, you know, for example, how you would mimic Beam's windowing, perhaps, right? You could set a timer for when a window is done. And when that timer goes off, uh, you can do some processing, right? Even if no elements were coming in. So this is sort of bringing the basics of how Beam is implemented up and giving you a lower level uh, operation you can use. Um, and I, you know, it's important to call out here, there's no synchronization of the state, right? Because that's the trouble with concurrency um, is that, when you have to synchronize on state, you both you have bugs, uh, you have performance problems, and in this case, the pattern of synchronization, exactly how things are parallelized, is already built into the operation. Um, okay, so so now I'm just going to talk through how you know how this works in Beam, this this pattern of how you would do this computation. I'm going to start with um, an example of like why you might use it and how you might use it. Um, it's pretty basic. There's sort of um, imagine. See the cloud over here is um, the uh, some service, right? And if you have used Beam a lot with some distributed runner, you may have already overwhelmed a cloud service with your pipeline. Um, it's very easy to do. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, you will. I'm guessing. Um, but yeah, so if you just like make a request per element, for example, right? Um, Spark and Dataflow and Flink and Samza, these can all scale up to you know, extremely high scale and knock over services. Um, you're not going to want to do that. And if they're billing you, you're not going to want to pay for it. So what you really want to do is just make requests at some reasonable interval. You're processing data so fast, you want to 
gather up your elements um, and make fewer requests. So this is an example of how to do that with stata timers. So um, I'm processing red squares. I only I only ever process shapes here. Um, so I have my on element, my process element method. And this, this blue square is my do fun. I'm writing this in, in boxes and arrows. And later, I'll show you Java and Python. But um, the squares are coming in, right? I can't make one request to this cloud service per uh, red square, or I'm going to overwhelm the service and also uh, spend all my money. Uh, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer. These elements are coming in. I say, uh, you know, I'm going to save, like, say half a second is a an OK amount of latency. I'm going to save half a second of elements. Um, and, and then I'm going to make a request to the cloud service. Um, I keep saying cloud service. It's a service on the internet. It may not, you know, it's on somebody's cloud. Um, but yeah, so so the elements come in. Um, and I know that I'm going to want to make a request uh, with regard to each element. I'm going to want to make a request to the service. So I'm going to buffer those. And this here, I'm saving those request metadata that I'll need as triangles off into my state on the side. Um, and in half a second, this timer is going to fire and say, OK, uh, we'll call it on timer. So you will register a callback. Um, and then you'll have some code you can write. And that code can read the state. So now I'm reading all the states, uh, the requests that I buffered up. And I'll make them all in one single round trip. right? And here I'm sending all four of these red triangles. And I'm getting back these red circle responses, and then I can output uh, the results of the batch RPC, right? And at the scale of what you're doing, right, in a, in a big data pipeline is, you know, it's not four, right? We're talking about reducing it by, you know, factors of thousands. Um, so, so it's pretty important and even extremely small, even if you had this timer set for like 10 milliseconds or, uh, you know, even if the timer simply was calling back in the next bundle, uh, you could uh, end up saving a lot. And so that's the example of a kind of thing you would do with data timers. The use cases are very broad because it's such a it's a low level concept with a lot of capabilities. So um, this is what it looks like. Um, I wanted to show you the sort of the boxes and arrows version before I showed any code. I'm going to flip through a couple slides of code. Uh, I don't have a cool notebook, so I'm going to do something even worse than having no code by putting codes on slides. So here's my slide with code. This, so on the top is what it kind of looks like in Python. I've got um, I've got a counter. Here we've got um, I'm, I'm making a staple do fun, and in Python you extend theme dot do fun, um, and to say I am going to store a counter. You call value state spec. And you can see Java below, we also have something called a value state and a state spec. But in both cases, I'm saying I'm going to store one value. And I'm going to, I'm saying, telling um, Beam that it's going to be an integer. Um, and then that's just the description of the state you're going to store. And then when you, in your process element method or your process method in Python, um, you describe in the parameters to the method what state you're going to read. So here we in Python, there's counter equals beam do fun state param counter state. You say, I'm going to read this state. And then you can um, read it. Might be nothing. And so I default it to 0 and then increment it. And in Java, it's the same. But uh, the Java do fun and like API is annotation based. And so uh, we say, give me the value state with the ID counter. Um, and so this, this is how what it looks like to access one of these state cells. It's a little bit verbose. There's kind of some boilerplate. Uh, the thing it, the reason we did this was because we can essentially do type checking on all of this. Before your pipeline starts running, Beam is going to check that you aren't using state that doesn't exist. I mean, and that the type of the parameter actually matches. Um, in Python, we're not doing the type checking part, right? So in some sense, we're trying to match the language's idioms. Um, I think in Python, we'll check that you're using state that actually exists. And in Java, we'll check that the actual type matches. Um, timers look similar. They're, you know, I couldn't fit it on one slide, so this is what it looks like in in Python. You say, I'm, I'm going to have a set of timer um, so that I can flush uh, so state. I'm going to store stuff in state, um, and I see that the after some amount of time, I'm going to output um, anything that's read in state, for example, right? And I don't want it to sit around for too long. Um, actually, 
here I've got a watermark timer, so that's not right. This has to do with if if a certain amount of time has happened without any action on this key, right? Like for example, um, a user having some activity, but then they've been idle for a certain amount of time, then this timer will fire. Um, and then I'll output whatever data I've buffered. And so uh, here I won't go over all the code because it's almost identical to how state worked, but the difference is you you need a callback, right? You can execute some code when the timer fires. So the, the on timer method um, can, uh, you know, it can read state, can output values, um, and it and it's associated with the timer that you've declared. Um, can I see a before you you yeah. carry on? Yes, uh, I wanted to mention that question by Raj. Uh, he's asking, uh, how is state and timer different from a window? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will talk a little bit about that. I would say windowing is something that you can implement yourself with state and timers, and windows. Um, what a window is, is essentially like a, a grouping key. It's a partitioning key that has a maximum timestamp so that all the state associated with the window can be discarded. So if you leave all your data, when you read data from the outside world, it's in the global window. And, you, and so that doesn't expire. And if you do, you can do state and timer work in the global window, and then your state and your timers will always be valid. Um, and that's roughly how state and how windows are implemented. Um, and but of course, runners can do more interesting and intelligent things. And this is different because you can express more things, right? You can express things that may not be expressible via the window examples because there's for windowing and beam there you can assign an element to a window, which is very much like assigning it a key. You can group by key and window, and so that's another operation you do with windows. And then windows can merge, um, and that's essentially it. Right? And so this will be much more fine grained. You can do things that you would not be able to express with Windows. Um, before we ex had state and timers, we, had, we actually had a lot of users writing very interesting and complex merging window functions. And um, it's sometimes it's much simpler to implement it directly. You often, your merge function is supposed to be associative and commutative. This is not required to be associative and commutative. Um, you do have to understand that your data won't be in order, but you can do fairly arbitrary processing, and you're not you're not constrained in the same way. I'm definitely going to talk about the relationship between state and timers and windows in a couple of different ways. That's I would say even most of the rest of this talk. So I'm going to move on, and and we'll talk, we'll do more questions after or later. Feel free to like put put another one in there. I I saw the question. I was waiting for the perfect moment to reply. Um, okay. OK, so here um, is one thing to know, since you asked. Um, state is actually already partitioned by window. So we sort of would have a state and timers are per key and per window already. So there's sort of a, you'd have a, a cyclic definition if, if it were defined in terms of windows, or windows were defined in terms of state and timers. Um, here, I've got, I'm storing like red, green, and yellow. Like these are keys. I'm using colors to represent keys still. So one key is Ken. Let's say I'm writing an app that just tracks every single thing a user does, maybe via their smartphone. I don't know. I don't know who <laughs> who would do such a thing. So, but so um, for Ken, I, I'm using fixed windows of one hour, and I'm just like watching what I do, and um, and in each window, I might have some state that is recording. You know what it seems like I'm mostly doing. So you might notice that in the morning, after 9 a.m., after I've I no longer have my kids with me, I'm doing some programming, and then I eat lunch, and then in the middle of the night I'm sleeping. Right. Um, and each of these stripes is in like the 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. window, the 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. window, and 11. These are all our windows. So when the watermark passes 10 a.m., no more elements are going to arrive. Right. The watermark measures whether you're going to ever receive any more data uh, during that event time. And once 10 AM is passed, according to Watermark, we can discard this data. So having the state per key and window um, means that we can automatically garbage collect uh, and free up the resources. So you can have an unbounded amount of data. Uh, and you can still write, you know, I think one of the philosophies of Beam is you write very simple straight line code. You don't do your own multi-threading. You don't do your own uh, sort of parallel um, 
you don't even think in terms of parallelism, you more think in terms of parallel patterns. And so this is what makes the state and timers um, paradigm sort of parallel per key and window and also able to process unbounded data. I see I'm jealous that Reza is on a flight. Um, that's something I haven't done in quite some time. Okay, so uh, the so here's here's where uh, windowing needs to interact well with state and timers. When you're writing beam pipelines, like I, I'm going to talk about you having users, but of course, often you're your own user. Um, so your user's view of your transform, like let's say I have this enrichment transform that I showed a few slides ago, where it makes requests to some external service um, by batching requests. Users don't care about the fact that it uses state and timers. And you, when you're using your transform, are not going to want to keep that in your mind. You're going to want to build some abstraction, right? This is just programming. Um, and uh, the important thing here is it needs to work, even if the person, like someone outside your transform, changes how they're windowing their pipeline. So the events come in, they're out of order, but you know they group it into, um, say, with grouping them into hours, and your transform needs to just work with, uh, with the data and output correctly windowed results. So it's the partitioning by key and window makes it more likely that you get this right, and it prevents some kinds of errors. But you still need to be uh, sort of thinking about that. Just to say the same thing another way with another illustration, here are two different pipelines, right? The one, um, first one is windowed into fixed windows of one hour. Second one is windowed into, say, 30-minute windows sliding by 10 minutes. Um, and what you want and what is um, not very difficult to achieve is that your state and timer, your do fund that uses state and timers, um, or perhaps in some more complex composite transform, you know, it respects this windowing and it outputs what the user uh, expects or what you expect, even when you change this, right? Because your pipeline is going to change all the time. It's going to evolve. So, and a third way of talking about how you this helps is. When we talk about ordering, um, we talk a lot about how like streams are out of order. They come from all over the internet. They're they're flying in from cell phones that might go through tunnels. And this is on the the first example here. We have this faucet of squares that are slightly out of order, and the state your stateful processing has to be robust to this. Um, what's interesting, right, is also a thing that you need to do is you need to reprocess old data. You need to like fix a bug and reprocess it. You need to uh, run experiments on archive data. And this stuff will be sharded. You know, it'll be archived to files. They'll be sharded a particular way. You may, they may be in order in some ways, but not in other ways. Um, but you don't want to sort, you don't necessarily sort all your data by event timestamp and certainly across the shards. They won't necessarily be like, you won't spend the time to merge them. And so you need to be agnostic to the order uh, that the data comes in. Um, and the windowing needs to work in batch as well, right? Batch processing is actually just delayed stream processing. So um, it needs to work for both. And that's a fundamental thing to be. OK. Um, there are just a few types of state. There only, I'm just going to highlight there's, there's a number of types of state to optimize for different access patterns. Value state is just saving one piece of data. right? It has, you can read it. You can write it. It has to get serialized and deserialized every time. It's always the whole value. I want to just, I'm not going to read all of these, but the bag state is important. This is how you would take a bunch of elements and you append them, right? If you're aggregating, you're sort of collecting stuff um, to be processed later, buffering stuff up, use a bag state, and it's very cheap to add things. You don't have to read the whole thing, add something, and then write the whole thing. And that's why there's a separate access pattern for a bag, which is the same as a multi-set. Um, combining state is like that, but when you add something, it can be combined using a combined function and then sets and maps sort of support the expected operations on sets and maps without um, having to read the entire value. So, uh, and I'd say the types of state, it's kind of open-ended. We might come up with more, right? Um, I think recently now there's an ordered list state that has a way of like doing range selection um, on a, a list of elements. Um, there are two types of timers. Um, I hope it's been emphasized enough that uh, processing time is not event time. These are totally different things and have totally different purposes. Um, processing time is as your pipeline runs, right? And setting a timer in processing time means like as they're processing, you know, as we're running, um, maybe I'm driving a UI, I want the UI to refresh, right? So setting timers like that makes sense. Um, 
and or periodically outputting, like you're doing an aggregation and it's the same idea, but just generally like if you don't want data to get too stale or if you just wanna like keep some cadence, that's what processing time timers are good for. Event time timers are totally different. They are um, they have to do with your data, right? And these are relevant in a batch situation too, because your data may you know may show that a user was idle for a certain amount of time, um, and you're going to want to output based on um, the fact that that happened, uh, or you know at the halfway through your event time window, uh, you might want to output your speculative output, um, and then when a window is over, you know when when a certain special time like as the user experienced it um, occurs, then you want to uh, output. And this event time timers are also how you, um, right, how you make sure that you don't accidentally leave any data behind, um, right? Because when event time is what we use to garbage collect state when we know no more um, inputs are going to be ar arriving within a window. Okay, um, last conceptual slide is uh, some people might think, hey, thanks for giving us this great other way of doing our processing. I'm only going to use this all the time. Um, it's You can, but please don't, I guess, because this is, you know, it's lower level. It constrains the data processing engine more. Um, it is, you know, single threading is the opposite of parallelism. So you, you, you know, you take exact control of what parallelism is available uh, in your pipeline. And, and it's a lot of boilerplate. So this is not like, this is sort of an underlying primitive for a lot of stream processors, but you should be able to use like the, the high level beam primitives for a bunch of your work, right? And the very complex pipeline, I could imagine state end timers uh, show up. Um, you know, it's not uncommon, um, but, uh, you know, think about it and, and reach for this when it's the right tool, um, don't, not just because it's the only tool. Okay, let's see where we're at on timing. Um, so this is where we're transitioning into Reza's example. This is a non-trivial example. Um, it's not too complex, and this is so you can see what kind of code you might write if you're gonna say, I've got users, they're watching a video, um, and I'm gonna have these various events that represent moments in the video, like stopping, starting, restarting it, and then these quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three are events when they're like a viewer reaches a certain point in the video. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of boilerplate on these slides. I'm going Java because that's, that's what, uh, it sort of just came first. And I haven't ported it to Python yet. Um, and you may have to write a lot of boilerplate using certain timers. Um, it's very low level. Um, and always remember that order is not guaranteed. We're not sorting uh, events as they come in. Okay, so well, as a user watches the video, I'm going to have these um, these rules. I'm going to we're going to have a few rules about these events. These are the events I just described. We're starting the video, progressing through the video, hitting the end of the video. The user can also pause, restart, and stop. What do we want to know about users watching these videos? Well, here are the four, four rules. Rule zero is when the window is expiring uh, or when the user the video finished and there's been 10 minutes with no activity, we're gonna output. Uh, rule number one, we're gonna output every time we see somebody make it to the third quarter. We're gonna call that a view. We're gonna say, okay, we're gonna go pay Ken for uh, the fact that somebody watched his video. Um, this rule two is, is to output when you see a stop, um, right? The user stops the video and then sort of abandons it for two minutes. And then rule three is when there's multiple restarts uh, without any quarter being passed. So um, that sort of implies that the page is being refreshed. Maybe they're like, hey, I can't get it to play. <laughs> um, so rule zero is going to use uh, one timer and one piece of state. I'm going to record, I'm going to have all these events coming in, and I'm going to record for each user what is the maximum timestamp uh, that I've seen. Uh, and I'm also going to keep track of this timer for when we have an end and then no activity for 10 minutes, right? And so by by when this timer fires, I'm going to be able to check, like, has it been 10 minutes since the maximum timestamp? So when I um, when I access this timer and, and state cell in, in a do fun, 
this is what the declaration looks like. I won't read it over, but you can see that I have a TTL timer and the maximum timestamp observed as a value state. And the body of the function, I'm going to take the max of the current timestamp that an element has and the one that we've seen so far. I'm gonna write that to state and then I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes. Uh, after that. So one thing uh, to note, the TTL timer is reset every time this is called. So every time I get an element, I'm, I'm overwriting the prior timer. This is cheap. This is free. Um, in general, right, this is all done. And at, when a bundle is committed, it does reset the timer. Um, but it's fine to do it every element. And we're just making sure by writing it to state that uh, we always, across all bundles, we're always writing the actual maximum timestamp observed. Note that I, I do a read right and then a read here, even though I have the value available. No. Um, when the timer fires, um, here I'm I'm taking the key, so I sort of I know what user it was, um, and then I'm doing some I'm saying uh, GC happened, like where this this view is done uh, for that key. And it's that's that simple because I reset the timer when it does fire. Uh, that means nothing else has actually happened um, since the last time it was set. I'm noticing that we're short on time, so I actually think that working through the rest of this example, um, I'm okay with going over. But I think I'm going to skip to the interesting rule. Um, Actually, the interesting rule, I think, is let's do rule two, um, which is roughly, the rules are all very roughly the same. But so this is alpha when we see a stop, but no activity for two more minutes. Okay. That's another. Now I'm, now I'm waffling. So let's just do this one. So I'm still using the maximum timestamp observed, and now I have another timer for rule two. Um, and this one is actually essentially the same as rule rule zero. So I, I grabbed the wrong one. I grabbed the wrong one. Um, what I'm doing here uh, when the timer fires is I'm checking um, whether or not the timestamp for this timer is actually is after the maximum timestamp observed in order to output that rule two is what happened. Right. Um, interesting. I'm going to actually zip ahead here. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to call it because I know we're out of time um, and I want to have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I chose, I'm sorry, I chose rule two. That was a bad, bad call. It's almost the same as rule zero, um, but I'll, I'll stop here.